Okay, it's 8.05. Uh, I guess we, we can uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Martos, do you want to introduce Dr. Supa? Yeah, I would like to introduce Dr. Suparek. Uh, he's a great friend, has been in this meeting, I think, more than 15 years. Uh, Supra is from, from Bangkok, Thailand. And he's going to present like a, another interesting case. And uh, Supra, thank you for, for being here to present today. And let's let's uh, check your case. And uh, looking forward for a great dis interaction discussion with the other panelists. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matos. I didn't know I've been joining this conference for 15 years already. <laughs> so long. Uh, I, I'm going to ask uh, my IT uh, guy to, to uh, control the slide for me because I have the problem. I'm at home right now. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to present uh, a case, a gunshot wound case that is quite interesting. Uh, next slide, please. They might want to go into the presentation mode and, and uh, so. I'll, I'll ask him. Uh, if, if you hear me, please uh, make the, the presentation in the full screen, the, the presentation mode. Yes, that, that's it. Thank you. So we have a young guy. Uh, he was shot uh, once at his right upper arm, uh, close to his uh, right shoulder, just one hour before uh, being transferred to the rural hospital. Uh, next slide, please. And the first chest x-rays, you can see a uh, large amount of pneumothorax on the right and collapse lung of uh, the, the right lung. And you can see the, the bullet on the left uh, lower neck, but the entrance uh, was on the right shoulder. Next slide, please. And he, he was quite stable. Uh, he, he was able to talk, uh, no stridor, but he was tachypneic and his saturation was quite low uh, on oxygen mass feedback. Uh, he got right 94%. And he had a massive subcutaneous emphysema at the right chest and the, right, and, and the neck and decreased breast sound on the right side. He uh, was quite hypertensive and uh, heart rate was 68 per minute, no active bleeding. And his disease was okay. Uh, they did the quick lock roll at the raw hospital and they didn't find any wound on the back and no blood uh, on rectal examination. <coughs> and the fat uh, was negative also. So, so the, the first question to the group is, uh, what is the initial management for this patient? Thank you. Dr. Hodgman, would you like to start? Sure, uh, if I can make another suggestion before I start, uh, you should change the display settings on the top so it's only the main slide showing here. Uh, so this, uh, essentially you do the ABCs and now you have a patient who has, but appears to be a, you need a, a, has a massive air leak on the right side on, and he has a bullet on the left. So he has no stridor, he's not coughing blood. So it's probably a bronchial injury. Um, so how to address this? The patient is hemodynamically stable so this is one of the few thoracic cases where I consider doing a CT scan initially. Why? Because it will determine the approach. I have had cases like this when you try to approach from the right and uh, from the right thoracotomy and it's in the uh, thoracic inlet. And it's very difficult to reach the esophagus and, and um, sorry, the trachea covered by the esophagus in that area. And, um, and sometimes you need to go through a median sternotomy uh, because the bullet is on the other side. So I will suspect the bronchial injury based on whatever has been described here, but I am not sure. And because the patient is hemodynamically stable and it will change my surgical approach, I would probably go with the CT scan first if it's possible. 
If not, if the patient starts deteriorating quickly in front of me, uh, probably have to come into a right uh, posterior lateral thoracotomy. Uh, this patient will need to be intubated with a double lumen tube and the bronchoscopic guidance. This cannot be done blindly. They have to do a bronchoscope to make sure that there is not um, uh, an injury close to the carina and, um, and um, go that way. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Kasim. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, the first thing I would do to make sure that the patient is oxygenating well and single chest tube in a case like this is not sufficient and uh, the patient will require uh, a basal chest tube plus an apical chest tube. So you need to employ, uh, deploy a second chest tube. There, you, you, you need to do it in such a way that the chest tube lies in the apex of the right thoracic cavity. And then you also need to deploy uh, a double drainage system whereby the chest tube goes into one bottle and then the yeah, bottle is connected to the second bottle. And then you need to put that on um, an adequate uh, suction pressure uh, to make sure that the patient um, responds, uh, his lung gets at least partially expanded. And you need to try everything you can to prevent this uh, injury into a tension pneumothorax situation because that will be catastrophic. Having done those two, and if the chest tube, the chest tube bottle is still bubbling like crazy, then you need to uh, think of uh, more than likely the patient has a bronchial injury. And um, <clears throat> the first thing I would do would be, I would do a bronchoscopy and um, under, guidance of, under guidance of the uh, anesthesia, uh, perhaps by then he would be intubated. And to intubate the left lung um, is not that hard. And, um, but to, to deploy a colon tube, a double lumen tube is quite difficult. And you need to have experience in doing that. If you can get that done, hooray, you're in, you are in a good situation. And, um, and see if he responds to the double chest tube suction, et cetera. And if you still suspect uh, the pneumothorax is not relenting, and then you have to send the patient for a CT to see what other information you can decipher from that. And, uh, and then we'll go from there to see what type of surgical approach the patient will need uh, to get this corrected. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Untrack, anything to add before we go on? Um, well, yeah, the only thing is, and I agree with um, uh, all the comments, um, they, they look, I saw one x-ray, it looked like the patient already had two uh, chest tubes on the right side without uh, any re-expansion of, of the lung uh, or, or drainage of that, uh, uh, the fluid collection of the, uh, with the air fluid level on the uh, lower right side. So it suggests that there is uh, a massive air leak, um, you know, that we presume that. It, 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 and if there is, then uh, everything, I would agree with, with all the comments that both Dr. Uh, Hockman and, and Dr. Uh, Kassam uh, made. Uh, and I think if there is a massive air leak, uh, then uh, uh, and the patient's getting more dyspneic, I would intubate him, and um, in that case, probably take him straight to the OR if, if that's if that's the issue. What if that's the reason why uh, the, the chest tubes are not uh, re-expanding the lung? Thank you, Dr. Supa. Would you like to continue? Thank you, everyone, for your comment. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, what the, the rural hospital did. They tried to put uh, two chest tubes in. At first, they, they put uh, the first one in. They uh, found that the x-ray uh, was not quite good. So they, they did put the, the second one. 
and uh, he still had a uh, retained pneumothorax. Uh, anyway, he he became more uh, more stable. He uh, his uh, respiration rate was down to around twenty, and he was transferred to us several hours after he was shot. Next slide, please. Next one. Uh, next slide. So uh, when he arrived at our hospital, uh, airway and, and breathing are quite okay, but he still has, uh, he still had cardinal air leak from the, the intercostal chest veins. And you can see that uh, the right lung uh, did not expand very well after uh, the two chest tubes insertion. And at that time, we thought about tracheal bronchial, uh, bronchial injury. Uh, next slide, please. The first thing we did, we tried to uh, revise the uh, chest tubes and we could uh, obtain more air coming out of the chest tube. And you can see that, uh, you can see that the chest expansion was uh, a little bit better and he uh, remained stable all the time. So after uh, the revision of uh, chest tubes, we uh, sent him for the CAT scan. Next slide, please. Uh, could you please uh, play the video on, on the left? first. Yes, that's one. Thank you. Uh, click at the play button. So ba basically, as we can see here, you can see uh, ret <coughs> retained pneumothorax on the right and uh, some amount of uh, pneumobiasinum. Next slide, please. And this is the, the IV contrast, uh, show no uh, vascular injury in this patient. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the, the picture to summarize uh, all the findings. So he uh, had remain a pneumothorax on the right uh, chest and uh, collapsed right lung. And you can see uh, two holes on the trachea, uh, one on the right and one on the left uh, as uh, depicted by the, the arrows. So uh, now we suspected the tracheal injury and uh, the position of injury is at the thoracic outlet. And he had a rib fracture and some pneumohemothorax. So the next question to the group, uh, now we have the findings, the patient remains stable. Uh, what should we do for this patient? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Super. Dr. Untracht, would you like to start? Yeah, it's a great, great shot. I mean, it, you know, an inch uh, in either di any direction, uh, he wouldn't have come to you, but it looks like the bullet just went in and out through the trachea. And, and again, the level, uh, Remind me of the level, is it in the medius, I guess it's in the mediastinum, the upper mediastinum. Um, uh, so, um, you know, the best way to approach it, I think that the best uh, thing to, to do for this gentleman is to intubate him. And you, you shouldn't need a, um, a double lumen tube, but once you intubate him, then, you know, you're across the injury. And in the process of doing that, you can inspect the injury with, um, um, with with a, 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 a flexible uh, bronchoscope, and uh, uh, and at that point, you know the kind of, you have to consider the kind of repair you should do, and and the repair can be it's not terribly urgent because you have control of the airway, um, but um, you know if you approach it through one chest or the right chest, uh, in, in the upper right chest, well, how would you how would you repair the wound on the other side. So uh, I, I think probably uh, a, a reasonable approach would be through the uh, through the low neck and then mobilize the trachea and bring it up into the neck and mobilize it enough so that you can just advance it up and then uh, do a direct repair. That would probably work. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Hodgman? Uh, this is, I would do this through a median sternotomy with ex maybe with extension to the anterior to the left sternocleidomastoid muscle on the left. Um, that should give you good exposure of the trachea on both sides. This is the problem I was 
trying to describe at the beginning, uh, if you jump into the right chest, uh, you have the problem that you cannot fix the other side and the esophagus is just next to it. So this guy, I will try to determine before the surgery if he has any vocal cord palsy uh, because of the recurrent laryngeal. Um, uh, but if it's not possible, whatever. So mid and sternotomy, and depending on the size of the hole, uh, primary repair in both sides or resect that segment and repair the trachea by approximating the two ends with um, some absorbable suture like vitro, um, like zero vitro. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And I will explore, make sure there's no injury to the esophagus. Probably when I have everything under control, I probably will do an esophagoscopy just in case, just to be sure. But based on the location, um, this is, this is uh, I remember I had a patient like this once, it's the most difficult area to expose if you have an esophageal injury because you don't have any good exposure from the chest uh, anterior to the median sternotomy or through a toracotomy. So hopefully he doesn't have anything on the esophagus, but otherwise I would try to repair the esophagus, accessing it from the left after extending the incision in the neck anterior to the right stern uh, left sternocleidomastoid muscle. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Kasim, would you like to add anything else? Well, I personally have not had a case like this, but I did attend Dr. Uh, Grillo's lecture several years ago, and he showed a case something similar to this. And I think if I uh, recall my memory, my fading memory, uh, I think he employed a T-shaped incision, which is a median stenotomy and a transverse neck incision. And then you get a panoramic view of the thoracic inlet. But before I do that, I would do an uh, uh, flexible esophagoscopy. And that's the first thing I would do and in the operating room. And then I would do my incision like, I, like Dr. Grillo does a T-shaped incision. And then you look at, you're looking at the injury uh, directly. And uh, if I recall again, I think he put primary sutures and then buttress it with bilateral uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle uh, to cover it up. And that is what I remember. Uh, but my memory is fading at this moment. Uh, so let's see what others will do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Supa, would you like to continue? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, interesting comments. And uh, I'm gonna show you what happened to the patient. So uh, this patient, we uh, thought about esophageal injury also, even though he didn't have any difficulty swallowing or blood uh, tint in his saliva. Uh, anyway, we started with a uh, esophagoscopy, and we found that uh, he had a uh, normal finding. Uh, could you please uh, go to the next slide? Uh, next slide, please. Next one, uh, and play the video. Thank you. No, no, no. Uh, we go back one slide, and uh, play this video first. Uh, this is the the is the esophagoscopy. Uh, basically, it's normal finding <laughs> to, to summarize to you, uh, no holes in the esophagus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and after that, we decided to perform a bronchoscopic intubation plus a bronchoscopy to uh, avoid inserting the tube uh, blindly to the false uh, and, and create the false tract. Uh, this patient, the anastologist, did the bronchoscopy, bronchoscopy intubation. And after that, uh, we try to examine the, the trachea starting from the carina. And we uh, draw the bronchoscopy. We, we draw the, we do the bronchoscopy uh, together with the ET tube back up and examine the, the trachea carefully. And you can see here on the right and the left of uh, this level, we can see two holes in the trachea. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, the, the finding from the bronchoscopy. 
and uh, the level of injury is around uh, eight to nine uh, tracheal rings. The, the eighth and the ninth tracheal ring, 10 centimeters away from, from Carolina. So uh, would this finding change your surgical approach? Uh, I, I would like to hear from the panelists. Uh, you can keep uh, playing this video while we have the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Kasim, would you like to start? Yes, it would change my surgical approach. Um, now I probably would not uh, uh, employ the uh, mid stenotomy. I think I would just do a transverse neck incision, and because I can get to get, get to this area quite readily, and knowing the esophagus does not have a hole in it is a plus, and I don't have to start looking anything into the esophagus, so I would uh, try to. You don't even need a, a double lumen tube now because you can put the ET tube just above the carina and you still have a plenty, lots of space above that to be able to do your primary repair. And I would go ahead and do a primary repair and then buttress it with the strap muscles from the neck and, uh, and then test it to make sure that it's uh, airtight and, and then leave the endotracheal tube in place and take the patient to ICU. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Untrack? Yes, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I basically I agree with uh, uh, what Dr. Kassam said. Looking at the CT, when you showed it again, the, uh, the, the injuries are at the level of the first rib. In fact, just uh, above the level of the first rib. Uh, so, um, yeah, it seems like you should be able to, to mobilize the trachea and uh, approach it through a, a neck incision. And if you can't, then you can always uh, I guess, tee it down across the, uh, the upper sternum and do a sort of a trap door, semi-trap door incision. But uh, it looks like you, you won't have to do that. And then, uh, you know, now there are these gastroenterologists that are, are operating on achalasia endoscopically. Uh, within the next 10 or 15 years, it's probably going to be some enterprising, some aggressive uh, pulmonary specialist, or maybe even a thoracic surgeon it's going to be able to repair these um, uh, bronchoscopically. You know, that I don't think there'd be a lot of those around, but uh, probably somebody with good with a bronchoscope can just uh, uh, suture it up from the uh, transluminally. But uh, but in this case, I, I agree with Dr. Kassim, go with a, a low neck incision. Thank you. Dr. Hodgman, anything to add? Uh, no, um, uh, this, yes, yeah, look like a neck injury. Um, I... I would probably go with a vertical incision in front of the sternocleidomastoid muscle uh, in case I need to extend to an sternotomy. Um, you have more information now, so you are probably sure that there is no vessel injury, there is no innominate vein injury. Uh, I would prep the chest anyway because I wouldn't be surprised if you need to convert this to an sternotomy. Uh, the trapdoor incision for the sternum is a very good one that will give you access to more of the trachea without, uh, so you go with, divide the sternum in the middle to the level of the second uh, intercostal space. And after that, they split the sternum there uh, to give you more exposure. Um, as Dr. Um, Untra said, uh, they, repair some of the injuries endoscopically with a stent. This is really very big. I know, I remember, because I also trained at my general with, when Grillo was still there, they were putting some stents in the trachea, but I haven't seen them in a long time. So I don't think that for the trachea excess or the excess, they are not widely utilized. But yes, I think probably the future will be there on repairing this endoscopically. But at this time, I would just, uh, repair primarily, and um, I would not do a tracheostomy on this guy, just repair the trachea and get out. Uh, one interesting thing is that he was having a massive air leak on the right, uh, and they couldn't inflate the right lung, so they, they 
cross-sectional area of that hole in the trachea is the same size or close to the same size of the right bronchus. So that's something to consider um, when doing positive pressure ventilation. So I will try to go as possible with the tube below the level of the injury as, as fast as possible to avoid that leakage. But obviously this patient tolerated the leakage well and, uh, and after that explore and repair. Thank you. Yeah, one more thing. Uh, Another thing to prepare the chest is because when you go there, it's not unusual that some injury like the nominate vein suddenly start bleeding and you cannot see anything or you don't know where the bleeding is coming from. And the neck is a very, uh, the exposure is very, very limited that you can get in the thoracic inlet. So having the, in an emergency, having the ability to take out the sternum, maybe I'm too aggressive, but uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it made the situation much more controllable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hodgman. Dr. Supa, please continue. Thank you very much uh, for all the comments. So uh, we go forward. One slide, please. Next slide. Next. Oh, no, no. Uh, go back one slide. So uh, this, in this patient, after we, we saw the uh, bronchoscopic finding, we decided to use the, the big call incision to approach the trachea from the neck. And uh, fortunately, we could uh, expose the trachea nicely and we could identify the two holes on the left and the right of the trachea. Uh, after uh, exposing and mobilizing uh, the, the trachea. And we repair these two holes with a PDS suture interruptedly. And uh, we use a uh, sternocleidoid muscle, uh, muscle flap to uh, reinforce the, the repair. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. And we found no uh, esophageal injury on uh, the neck exploration. And uh, this, in this patient, we uh, put the balloon uh, below the, the repair uh, by a bronchoscopic guidance. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And this is how the patient looked uh, post-operatively. Uh, after the repair, he was uh, doing okay in the ICU and few days after that, we uh, extubated the patient and he was transferred to the floor. Uh, he could, uh, he, he breathed uh, quite well and he uh, was able to eat normally. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the chest X-ray post-operatively. So uh, there was no fur uh, further air leak and we removed the chest tube. And next slide, please. Uh, before he was discharged, we did the X-ray again and it was uh, normal. So uh, this is all I have uh, for, for today. And it was very interesting to, to hear the great comments uh, from, from you guys. And I'd like to hear the final comments. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Hodgman, would you like to start us off? You're muted. Dr. Hodgman, you're muted if you're speaking right now. So I think this is the beauty of this conference, how uh, surgeons in different areas can solve the same problem using different techniques. And, and that's the, 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 the beauty. I congratulate Dr. Supa because he uh, managed this uh, better than I would have done it. Um, he kept calm and um, determined what the injuries were and did a, what is technically a minimalistic approach to repair this with very good results. Uh, so congratulations, Dr. Supa. Dr. Untracked? Yeah, what a case. And, and I'd be interested, how, how was he shot? Was he on a motorcycle or a scooter or just a pedestrian? But And also the, the, that last uh, drawing that you showed, it looks like the injury was the level of the third tracheal ring. That's right at the location where you would, uh, that's where you put a trach to. 
you know, between the third and the and the fourth uh, trade guild rings. So, um, uh, you know, if it was if that's where you knew it was ahead of time, well, you, you know, then I think it's you know doing the neck incision, but being prepared to do a sternotomy was was the right approach. But, but what a great case! And then also be interested. What was the problem with the chest tube? That the initial chest tubes, the two of them, looked like they were in well. They're in good position. Uh, but yet they didn't work. So um, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, in this patient, I think he, he was shot while he was uh, sitting in the bar or something, not a um, motorcycling. And uh, the reason why the, sh the first two chest tubes uh, did not work very well, uh, I I'm not quite sure. Maybe there was some uh, mucus plug or uh, some kinking. But uh, once he got to our hospital, we put the new chest tubes and uh, try to advance the, the tubes uh, a little bit deeper until we got a gush of air. So I'm, I'm not quite sure about the, the technical mistake of the first two chest <clears throat> tubes. Thank you, Dr. Utra. Dr. Kasim. Yeah. Uh, but also my last question, what, what, sure. was it really at the third, at the level of the third tracheal ring? Uh, the two it, it was around uh, the eighth and the ninth. Uh, but you, from this picture, we, we mobilized the trachea and we used the, the thumb to, uh, to push the trachea up from uh, above the menastinum. But it's uh, definitely lower than, than the tracheostomy site. Thank you, Dr. Untrat. Dr. Kasim. Dr. Supa, did you use a double uh, drainage system with suction on the second one? Uh, it, in my country, the, uh, the drainage system for the chest tube is not a Purovac like in the US. It's like a, the bottle uh, with the water just two right. centimeters above the, the level of uh, the, the glass tube uh, to prevent air uh, entering the, the chest. And uh, we use, in this patient, we use one bottle system because he did not have a lot of blood. And we just use the, the one bottle for uh, preventing the air uh, to get in the chest and connect that uh, bottle directly to the suction. Okay. Um, this case is, is, is as good as Dr. Grillo's. <laughs> Fabulous, you know, really nice uh, pictures and executed and brilliant, brilliantly. And um, uh, what a case, a fabulous case, you know. He's smiling uh, down for me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that you, know, you should one, one should show this to uh, the upcoming thoracic surgeon trainee. You know how to uh, take care of two holes in the trachea with one incision, and brilliantly done. Thank you so much. Hey there, uh, Dr. Kobe on the chat says he that they uh, there are some questions. Dr. Kobe, would you like to go ahead? Uh, thank you for allowing me to ask a question. So one question. So you had the burette uh, retained in his left thorax, but the X-ray shows uh, you can easily take the burette out from his cavity. Uh, did you try to the burette uh, out from his cavity or not? Okay, thank you, Dr. Kobe, for, uh, for your question. Uh, on exploration, we could not uh, see the, the bullet very clearly. And we, on the CT scan, uh, it's not so very deep. Uh, but anyway, during the, the next exploration, we could not easily find it. And we usually, not, uh, we usually don't try to go after the bullet so hard uh, because uh, most of the time we can leave it. Uh, without a, any complications, without uh, any infection. We, we're gonna try to remove the bullet 
uh, only if uh, the bullet is in the important structure like intravascular bullet or in the joint or uh, in the bone, something like that. But uh, usually bullet in the, in the deep soft tissue that could not uh, be easily found, uh, we leave them alone. Thank you, Dr. Kobe. Thank you your question, for your question, so your answer. So uh, last question. So I hear uh, injury uh, caused by bullet uh, seems to match our more infections. So uh, did you try to uh, prevent the infection from the wound before operation or? Uh, thank you. Uh, we, we gave the patient uh, antibiotics, IV antibiotics uh, for a prophylaxis of the wound infection. And usually uh, post-operatively, this guy, he received a course of uh, IV antibiotics. And for, for the wound, we did, uh, after the repair, we did some irrigation with uh, normal saline uh, at, at the wound. Uh, on the entry side, we didn't do anything. We just do the, the, normal, dra the, the, the normal dressing, wound dressing. We didn't suggest uh, to close the hole. We just do the, the wet dressing. Okay, and uh, luckily, he didn't have infection. OK, so what antibiotics did you use? So cephalosporin? This patient, I think, is uh, cephalosporin. I think it's uh, uh, cephalosporin. Yeah. OK, but how many days did you use antibiotics? A week. Uh, week, one week. Yes, around, around one week. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Sutta. <laughs> okay, uh, I do not have access to the CME code, so I will make sure Liliana sends it out later this morning to the complete participant list here. Uh, so you should be getting it later this morning. Uh, Dr. Yes. Oh. And I, and everybody, please remember when you claim the CME code, you have twenty four hours to claim. If you if you wait a few days, it's not going to work. So please, uh, we're going to talk to Liliana to try to fix the CME situation with the registration. But once it's fixed, let's try to do it in the first twenty four hours. Thank you. Um, if there are no other follow up questions or comments from any of the of the panelists or from Dr. Supa. I I guess we will end this meeting unless anyone else yeah. has anything to add. Thank yeah, you very much super. again. Yeah. Great great case as usual. Uh, Supa is very uh, very happy to see you to see you doing well in your country. Looking forward for the next meetings uh, and see you all next Monday. Thank you Supa, thank you Kevin. Sure. Thank you very much Kevin and thank you very much Dr. Matos for the opportunity. And uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, for uh, discussing this case. I always learn new things from this meeting. Thank Dr. you everyone. And, and Dr. Have a Supa. Great day. Dr. Supa, maybe next time your son will want to <laughs> have some comments on <in> the background. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you all. Bye-bye.